Uh, okay, we should be live. If we can get uh, confirmation, we are good. Then that is great. Um, okay, so welcome to a web stack in an hour. This is a reprise of Technical Labs. Um, the Technical Labs is a series that BCSS ran in the first semester, um, and then we wrapped it up, but we thought we'd do a special one for uh, Launchpad. Um, and we're going to cover a web stack, which is basically just a... So we're, what we're aiming to do here is teach you everything you need to know to make a sort of a basic website. This is intended for to get everyone sort of up to speed um, to join in on any web-based uh, hackathon projects. Um, so a few things. So I'm going to run through the first half, and then we're going to switch over, and Joe's going to give you the second half. Um, and yeah, so if there's any questions, please uh, let us know, and uh, Joe will, whoever's manning the desk, will let us know. Um, so there's a few things first. We've uh, made some notes for this project, which Joe is going to give you the link for. If you want to follow along the notes, that's what we're going to be going through. Uh, there's an example project. So Joe's going to be making an example project to sort of show you everything we teach. And you're going to have access to that at the end if you want to sort of work from the project we build up on. And uh, the last thing is this is probably not a very good idea. Um, the whole thing. Uh, a web stack is an incredibly complicated thing, and an hour is not a long enough period of time to go through it. Um, that said, we're going to do our best, uh, and we're probably going to go over an hour, and um, this is not going to be enough information for you to start a career in web stack. This is going to give you enough information, hopefully, to make a cool hackathon project and give you some context which you can then use to learn more later. Right? We can't cover everything, but we're just going to teach you some, some basics and uh, so that you can then um, le uh, learn more if you need to. Uh, and so, you know, often in hackathons you sort of learn as you go, um, and hopefully this will give you some basic information that will then uh, assist you with, you know, when you're sort of looking stuff up online, give you some more context for what you're looking up. Um, okay, let me look through the notes. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, last thing, um, so we're streaming this through Hopin, um, which is... Uh, 720p. Uh, we've also streaming this to YouTube. So if at any point you can't see uh, the code or what we're going, uh, what's happening, um, you can switch over to the YouTube. Joe hopefully has put the link in the chat, or will do in a second. Um, and so if it's unclear, you please follow along. And then, and uh, we'll should be monitoring both chats if you want to send us any questions. Um, there will be a delay on the YouTube stream for about five minutes. Okay, there will be about there will be a delay on the YouTube stream apparently. Um, so I'm sure you can work it out one way or another. OK, so uh, let's start. So I'm going to cover the theory. So I'm going to give you some of the basics of uh, what's happening. And then Joe's going to give you an actual, uh, an actual run at it. Um, OK, so let's start with the very basic information of what is the web. Um, are we good to go? Yeah. OK, so what is the web? The web is. Uh, <laughs> If you're not a computer scientist, you may have sort of a misleading idea of what the web is. Um, often people conflate the web and the internet, which are different things. The web is the actual hardware used to connect computers, uh, sorry, the internet is the actual hardware used to connect computers all around the world. Um, you know, the, the actual copper cables going from house to house and the fiber lines under the ocean. Um, whereas the web is sort of a, a set of rules everyone agrees to of how to communicate and to, it's, a, it's an information system, so we can share documents and web resources amongst each other. Uh, sort of web, you know, web pages. Um, yeah, so the web is sort of the colloquial term for the World Wide Web, which is a, a system that was invented. Um, yeah, and then a web stack is a collection of technologies used to make uh, sort of websites or web apps for the World Wide Web. Um, so the World Wide Web communicates over the internet, which is the actual hardware system and the protocols used for uh, computers to co uh, communicate, uh, but then uh, you shouldn't conflate them. Uh, okay, so let's run through a very quick history of the web. Um, this isn't just trivia, this is useful because it has informed how the web works nowadays. Um, so the web started in 1989 by Timothy Berners-Lee at CERN, um, and, uh, and it's sort of over the 80s, the internet had spread across Europe, and uh, there was a link to America. Um, but 
we didn't have, uh, and, and so computers could communicate, but there wasn't this sort of system for, uh, so Berners-Lee wanted to have a system to share information um, and documents. So he, he, you know, all there were academic, uh, in, uh, pardon me, academic institutions all around the world that connected with the internet, but they didn't have a system for actually sharing files. They just sort of reached into people's computers and grabbed files. There's no way of sort of presenting files or uh, sharing them in a good way. And so uh, him and a team came up with, a, with the, uh, the World Wide Web, and they made the first website. To do this, they, needed, they uh, created a sort of language for defining these web pages, the hypertext markup language. And a protocol, so sort of a, a language for, for computers to communicate with to each other, um, protocol for requesting these documents. So the hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP. Um, so this is the reason I say this is important is because this is the web is a system for requesting data, right? You there are servers around the world, and you your computer simply requests a file and it will send a file. And that was the original, that was what it started as, and that's what it's grown from. Um, and indeed today, much of it is still the same, works the same way. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of hacks on top of this to add different, uh, different functionality that's come later. Um, and we'll touch on some of that. But the vast majority of it is just this basic system for requesting documents. Uh, okay, let's go over what is a web page. As you'll see, we're moving very fast. We've got a lot to cover, and we're targeting less than two hours. Um, so uh, what is a web page? So a web page is simply an address. We'll talk more about what an address is later, um, which returns a HTML file when requested. So uh, you know, if I go to www.google.com, if I just send a request to that address, it will send me back some HTML. Right, that is the basics of what a web page is. Um, a HTML file can itself say that it needs other files, right? So it may need some images, it may need a video file, so it can say, oh, when you load me up, grab these other files as well, and we'll see that later. Um, but that's technically all you need for a web page is HTML. Um, if you go to our notes website, this is just, this is a very simple website that basically just returns HTML. Um, there's a little bit of styling, so there's a language defined called CSS for uh, cascading style sheets for adding, making it look better. And uh, you can add some dynamic functionality with JavaScript. I'm sure a lot, uh, some of you are familiar with JavaScript. Um, but at the end of the day, really, the main event is the HTML. Um, and so uh, let's go into, let's look at some HTML. Um, sure. Okay, so yeah, so we're going to look at some HTML here, and I'm sort of going to describe what this HTML is doing. Uh, is that yeah? Can we switch over? Okay, awesome. Um, so here we've got some HTML. Uh, so this is so we're going to build a website later, and this is the HTML that is requested that, that is returned when we request the uh, a web page, a certain web page. Um, so what you can see here is the first line just defines that it is HTML. Uh, these are comments, so ignore these really, they're just for annotation. Um, and then this block here, these are called tags. So this tag set, uh, tells the document that we've started a block of HTML. Sort of, um, the head we use just for uh, sort of importing things nowadays. It did have a use, but it's not sort of used anymore. Um, so here we're importing a JavaScript library that we need called jQuery. Here we're importing some fonts. Uh, this is uh, and here, so we, um, we have a bit of dynamic functionality with this web page. So we've um, imported a JavaScript file that's got our dynamic functionality in it. And then we've got a style sheet to make it look better. Uh, and then, so HTML often describes the structure of the web page and the content. So we've ta it used to contain a lot of style information, but uh, in, modern, in the modern web, we tend to take all that styling out and put that in CSS files. Um, so there's no real styling in here, it's just the structure and the um, content. So here you can see we've got a, uh, a title, this is a, a header tag, which means a uh, title, uh, yeah, just a bit of text, and a button, so we can click that button later. And later we'll see what all of this does. Um, 
that's what Scrum One does. And then, so let's move on to some CSS. Okay, so this is uh, these are C this is what CSS looks like. Um, here's the CSS file for the same website. So when we said up here, sorry if the fast scrolling is making me go wrong. Um, so this file, we've said please bring along this file CSS slash main dot CSS. So that's just the file path um, to this file. So main CSS. So please bring along this file and apply it to our website. So this is uh, body, so everything in body tags, which is pretty much the entire website, we want to use this font, XO2, and have this background color. So the inside the body tags of the entire website, so everything is going to have this applied. Uh, then everything with the uh, dot title, so here you can see the class is title. So everything with the title class, this is going to be applied. So uh, these are just things that applied the color that we want it all to be uppercase and whatnot. Um, then everything that's got the subtitle block has the uh, class, has these. Um, then these are IDs, so everything that has the ID of main block is going to have this to sort of central line all the text. Um, yeah. So CSS just styles the code, really. Um, and then JavaScript. So JavaScript is sort of now the biggest part of most websites. Um, the websites can come with just thousands and thousands of line of JavaScript, add loads and loads of functionality. If you like open up a Google Doc, that is just a website, but it has just an incredible amount of JavaScript to make that into a sort of more of a web app than a, than a website, really. But we'll get into that distinction later. Um, so this is a little bit of JavaScript. It's, this is in, this is using a library called jQuery because it makes everything just much neater. Um, we recommend you use jQuery. Uh, so this says, uh, when the document loads up, uh, run this code for us, please. Um, set, start a variable called count and set it to zero. Um, when this button, button one, which we defined in the HTML, is clicked, run this code, increment the count, and set the text of the button. So it's a very simple bit of code. Again, we've just got some comments here. Um, I would love to do an introduction to programming right now, but we really don't have any time. Uh, this is just HTML syntax, uh, sorry, JavaScript syntax. It's um, supposed to be similar to Java, but HTML and Java are massively different languages. Really don't get, what did I say? Oh, sorry, Java and JavaScript are massively different languages. Their syntax is somewhat similar, but really they need to be kept separate. Um, very confusing bit of history. Uh, and um, yeah, so that's our JavaScript that's providing our dynamic functionality. And here you can see what the website looks like. It's a very simple website, but you can see that it's got some styling, so it looks pretty nice. Um, and it's got this button here that when you click it will uh, increment. We can't see it here, but we'll get to that later. Um, OK. 15 minutes? OK. So that what we went through there was the client-side code. So there's this distinction in the web, client-side, server-side, front-end, back-end. Um, I'm going to start drawing things. Um, so we're going to have so we're going to have a client and a server. So this is how the web works. So the client is your machine. If you're visiting a website, this is your machine, your browser. We'll get into a browser later, but a browser is an incredibly complex piece of software. And then we've got a server. Um, a server is an unfortunately overloaded term. Um, a server both means the machine. Like, you know, you have like server farms that have loads and loads of servers in them. And it also means the bit of uh, the program that you run to serve up these files that I've been talking about, this HTML, CSS, and whatnot. Um, yes. So the server will run on servers. So we normally call the piece of software a web server and the machine a server. Um, it's just ridiculously complicated for no real reason. Um, it's just unfortunate. Uh, so, but in this, for the rest of this, we're going to say server when we mean the bit of software, um, because no one says web server. Um, so the client here, you run code, but it's very sandboxed. It can't store things permanently. It can't, well, in any good way. Um, and it, the code normally runs quite slowly um, because it's running inside a browser. Uh, whereas on the server, you have the full power of a server. This is just a, a normal program running on a machine. So you can do whatever you want, really. 
The only job of the server is to serve up files. So a client makes a request, a HTTP request. We're not really, we're going to touch on HTTPS, but no one uses HTTPS in hackathons. Um, makes a request, and then a server just sends back files. We did once, but that's because we had to, to get extra points, right? And that is the model, right? And you, all of your, if you have any data, so you know, like Facebook have a load and load of data, that is all st stored on servers, right? So here you have uh, databases as well. We're also not going to talk about databases because databases are just so complicated. <laughs> um, you can spend entire modules and degrees and PhDs on databases and servers and stuff. We're just being very brief. Um, okay, yeah, so the server simply in has an interface where it presents files that it can be requested. So a client makes a request for a specific thing from the server and the server will give files and then the client will go on to display those files to the, uh, to the user. Um, there's often a bit of confusion with, this might seem simple now, but there's often a bit of confusion as to where you should run certain code. Um, and so there's a few sort of things we should probably talk about. It's, um, a server has a lot of access to the data. It's normally stored on, well, for any sort of small project, um, it's normally stored on the same machine. So there's very, very quick access between these two. Um, so if you need to do any large data crunching, uh, it's best to do it here. Otherwise, you'd have to send all that data across to the client, which is the massive amount of data, you know, will be throttled and uh, might not even arrive. Sometimes, you know, you have to be uh, prepared to lose data across the connections. Yeah, it can be massively insecure. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, so if you're doing something like a, a video game where you don't want one player to know where the other players are, you shouldn't send that... Uh, data over to the client because then they can, uh, you know, they might manipulate it and see that data where they shouldn't. Um, so that's, so some data should be kept on the server and some data can be sent to the client. Some stuff needs to be done on the client. So for example, uh, when you take a part, when you take in a password, you can't just, you sh should never just send a password over a connection. You need to first hash it, where you sort of encrypt it, and then send it over. So that encryption needs to be done on the client side before it's sent over the open web. Um, hopefully that makes it a little bit clear, uh, clearer, but again, we're moving very fast. Um, yeah, But it's important to note that you can, you can do code on both sides. There's just strong opinions about what code should be done where, um, sometimes for good reason, sometimes not so much. Uh, cool. Uh, you'll see this more in the example. Um, what the other main thing is some stuff, the client, a lot, most client side stuff isn't kept between uh, visits to a website. So some stuff like will want to be stored in the server so that it can stay constant between websites, between visits to a website. Um, okay, let's very quickly go over what a browser is. Um, so a browser is a piece of software that runs on your computer and it's a metaphor really um, it's a, a lot of computing they use metaphors uh, to rep you know for what programs are supposed to do um, and a browser's metaphor is that a browser is like a, a window into the web it's the, sort of uh, something you could a porthole you can look through into the web to explore the web um, hence names like Safari and Internet Explorer um, yeah so some people describe it it's just like the Chrome around a web, hence the name Chrome. It's just like the window around the web where it's a hole into the web. There's lots of names. Um, but that is, right? And all that a browser's job is to do, all, is to take these HTML files and the, these JavaScript files and these CSS files and display them in the way that we all agree to, that they should be displayed, to interpret them and display them in the way they should be displayed. Um, there used to be big differences in how certain browsers would display certain things and what they would support, um, but most of that is gone now. Uh, most browsers support a pretty good similar set of features since Internet Explorer has lost its market share. Um, not to dunk on Internet Explorer. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Um, but th that's to say that like you're you're not making a program when you're sending over web data. You're just sending you're just sending stuff over and say please display this, and it might be different on different uh, browsers. So you should probably check on all the major browsers if you can. Um, cool. Right, that's most of that. Uh, browsers, I just want to reiterate this point. Browsers are just incredibly complicated. They do so much stuff. They have an engine for running JavaScript, which is a complete programming language now. Um, they have to display HTML, which is just a ridiculous thing to actually have to display. Um, and they have to like serve up, you know, they have to have a complete engine for running uh, video streams and for, you know, downloading files and whatnot. But most of that is completely hidden from the actual web developer. Um, you know, Chrome and Apple and, you know, whoever deal with all of that while you only have to really deal with them um, making your web app, which is lovely. Uh, okay, let's very quickly touch on APIs. <laughs> we're moving just ridiculously fast. Um, so we're missing a part of the story here. This is all well and good if you're just like browsing Wikipedia, right? I just say, I want the Wikipedia article on dogs and they send back pictures of dogs, um, which is excellent. That's very useful. And that's what the internet was originally sort of made for. Uh, sorry, the web was originally made for. The internet's made for all kinds of things. Um, but this isn't always what we want to do. Sometimes we want to do other things uh, like, um, for instance, maybe you want to update an article on Wikipedia, or you want to have your own account on Wikipedia. I don't know why I'm stuck with the example of Wikipedia. Um, so for this, we have something called an API. Um, an API is an extremely broad term, or something you can use with this. It's an extremely broad term, but uh, it just means application programming interface. Uh, it's simply a way for two pieces of software to communicate. Um, but uh, and they're all over the place. Like most video games have a modding API, which essentially means here's a place for you to insert your software into our software. It's like an interface for that. But what you mean here is a web API. Um, and this is normally just simple places where you can uh, send HTTP requests to either send certain data or to receive certain data. Um, so for example, recently uh, Joe did a project where he uh, pulled the Spotify API for information about a user. So this is all done on the same system, right? It's You've got a client that's sending HTTP requests, but instead of sending back HTML, it just sends back arbitrary data, whatever they want. So it may be, what are your top 10 most listened to songs? So I just send, for this user with this authentication token and all of this stuff, send me back their most played songs and it will send that back, right? And this, um, this becomes extremely useful, right? Uh, for a lot of modern web apps, you need stuff like this to uh, have a fully working system, you know, to have more complicated functionality than just serving up web pages. Um, cool, we're, yeah. Uh, yeah, so in the notes, I gave the example of Wikipedia's API, that's probably why it's in my head. Um, they have an incredibly, expansive API, it's pretty incredible. Um, and you can do almost everything you can do through the website, right? So when you click on something like, uh, I don't know, upload an image on Wikipedia or change an article or change your username, right? You're on, they've served you HTML. And when you click that button to change your username, that isn't redirecting you to a new page. Because you can do that with a browser. You can say, this is what hypertext is. Hypertext just means from this page, you link to another page. But in, that's not doing that. That button is instead sending off a request to uh, Wikipedia's API to say, please change this user's password. And um, through this HTTP protocol. Um, okay, so let's, we've talked about HTTP. I'm gonna very quickly give you an idea of what HTTP is. Uh, not really. Uh, <laughs> HTTP is a big thing. Um, to get head around, I don't understand HTTP very well. Um, all you really need to know is there's nine types of HTTP requests. Um, Joe will be showing you some of them later, but the ones we're really concerned with are a GET and a POST. Um, so this is, HTTP was designed for just like, you know, sending people files and 
getting files, uh, well, web pages. Um, so a get is I want this thing. You sort of specify something and it will give it to you. So I could say, uh, you know, get the article about dogs. And then a post traditionally meant update this or put this up. Joe's squinting and nodding a little bit. He knows more about HTTP than I do. Um, so you could say, you know, post this new article about dogs on Wikipedia. Something like that. That's not how they're used now. Um, they're sort of used like that, but... Yeah. Um, but those are... You will see these a lot when you sort of go end up doing some web development. Um, Joe will show you later that he is responding to get and post requests. Um, the most important thing about HTTP is the direction of information travel. Um, or So, a, with a, what you'll notice is this is any sort of HTTP request is started by the client, right? So, a client says, update this piece of information or what is, you know, how many likes do I have on Instagram or something? And the server will respond. The server cannot send, just start communication with the client. It cannot say, oh, tell this client um, how many likes they've got, or they got a new like. In, it, information is always started by the client. Um, this is a matter of restriction, uh, and so, as always, people have hacked to add functionality on top of this. Um, there's a piece of technology called WebSockets that basically allow, it's called full duplex communication, sort of both-way communication. Um, we are not going to cover WebSockets. But what you need to know about WebSockets is if you want to do this stuff, they're what you need to Google. Um, we use a, whenever we do projects, we use a package called socket.io. Yeah, that's um, and it doesn't work over HTTP, right? It uses uh, a TCP connection, which is so massively outside the scope of this session. Uh, um, okay, last, uh, second to last thing before I hand over to Joe. Um, one, security. Uh, uh, you may be aware that security is a big thing on the internet, and we haven't talked about it much. Um, that's, you know, a bit weird. Uh, it's because security on the internet is just so horrendously complicated. Um, you need to spend entire careers working on, you know, internet security. Cyber security is a massive industry, um, and we don't have time. Um, so, in the, in, when the internet was first came about, you just sent information over HTTP, which is just like sending text files back and forth. Anyone can just have a look at them if they want, really, because you didn't really care. No, I don't, I don't mind if someone wants me to, to know I'm asking for this article about dogs. You know, it's just an information system. As the internet grew to have things like banking and sort of stuff you wouldn't want people to know about, and just general personal information, uh, this became a big problem. Um, and so, long story short, nearly all information, all traffic over the internet is now encrypted, and we use something called HTTPS. Uh, I'm going to... No, I'm not. Um, if we switch to here, what you should be able to see is... Um, so, if you see here on my... Uh, I'm looking at the notes for the web page, and if you look at the top left, it may be a bit small, you'll see that it's HTTPS. Um, so this implies to me that this is uh, encrypted communication. So I know that the communication to and from my web server that I have set up um, is encrypted. So no one can sniff me looking at the uh, web stack, um, my web stack notes. Uh, so HTTP is extremely important. If you try and go to a website that doesn't have HTTP, most modern browsers will complain and tell you how insecure you're being. Um, and that's great, but HTT the reason we haven't covered it is because HTTPS requires something called a certificate um, and a certificate authority, which I think sounds cool, um, where essentially uh, a big company normally um, somewhere out there in the world, you send them, you know, a signed certificate to say that you are who you say you are. So I have told a big company that this web server, where I store technical labs, is the web server that technical labs is stored on. Um, and so when someone wants to go to this, make sure they're going to the right one. Um, and this is great. However, it normally takes, 
hours if not days to set up to get these certificates properly signed um, and to get all the DNS sorted out. Um, and so we're not covering it here because it's um, just a bit too, uh, it's too much. And normally you don't do them in hackathons because they take so long to set up. Um, so wouldn't worry about it, but if you want to take these projects that you do and uh, make them into a real thing and put them on the web proper, then um, make sure you do uh, HTTPS at some point. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, the last thing we're going to cover is URLs. Um, you've all seen URLs, I'm sure of it. Uh, they're what you, the links you put into a uh, website to go to a website. So let's take... Is wikipedia.org or, or .com? Yeah, I realized that while I was writing it. Um, hopefully you can see that. Yeah, you can. Uh, probably shouldn't have done red. Um, so a URL is a uniform resource locator, which is a very official sounding thing, um, which is basically just a way to point to resources on the internet. So from any machine in the world, you can put in a URL and it will l locate a specific file on a specific machine somewhere in the world, right, somewhere else in the world. They're quite incredible things, really. Um, and they are constructed. Uh, I think you can have seven things in a URL. Um, modern day ones don't unless you're doing some weird stuff like ssh uh so oh dear that went horribly wrong uh this is the scheme so this is uh not for websites it's either http or https um you can do other things uh, you could do like ftp which is file transfer protocol or uh VNC, as we were doing earlier. Um, but here, for websites, you're always going to be using either HTTP or HTTPS to communicate. Um, don't message me about doing other things, because they're all terrible. Um, and then you have the, uh, I think it's called the host name? Authority? No, the authority, sorry. Authority. Um, which just means where to, what server, right? So um, in the early times, uh, this would have been a IP address. Um, now we use something called DNS, um, d domain name servers, I think, uh, domain name system. D basically just says there's servers out there, some nice person host servers, where I say, I want www.wikipedia.org, and they look that up in a big table and find the IP address for Wikipedia. Um, and then they return that and your computer just goes there without you noticing. Um, but what we want to know is this is basically the address. Um, and then you have the path, which uh, basically is what's, once the browser finds the server you want to talk to, it hands it the path to specify what resource you want um, from that server. Uh, Joe will show you more of that later. Um, importantly, what you, this is what you'll see for most websites, but what we're probably going to be looking at if you're doing a hackathon, um, what you'll want is something like uh, localhost, uh, colon, and then uh, what number are you using? 3,000? That is not a three. 3,000 slash, I don't know. Dogs. Okay, so this means uh, we're going to use HTTP, as discussed earlier, for reasons. Um, I think the camera's out of focus. Kieran, can you jump on the camera and just tap on my face? Oh, okay, never mind then. Um, Localhost just means uh, on this machine. So don't go out into the internet, just stay on this machine. So if you're running the server software on the same computer you want to visit it from, uh, then you can just run uh, localhost. Um, which will be very, it's really useful for setting up servers and things where you haven't set up DNS. Um, highly recommended. Uh, and then the port, so you just do colon, then a port number. That, uh, we're not going to talk about ports. Uh, so there's stuff about like when you, like, I don't know, well, you picked it up, but like, you know, when you've got HTTP or HTTPS, the browser kind of puts that in by default. Yeah. And the port, the browser puts 
puts it in by default because the web uses 80 or 443. Yeah, so essentially there's a computer sets up loads of different places you can communicate to it to, like through. Um, so for example, it's 80 for HTTP 433? 443. 443 for HTTPS. And these are basically just numbers so you can approach it and say I want this number. 21 is uh, SSH. Uh, if someone, if you guys can still see us, can someone just post a message? Uh, I haven't seen any messages yet. Um, and then the, uh, and then again, the path is just the same. Uh, if you can still see us. Hmm. It might just be the internet type machine. Oh, okay, we'll keep going. Um, okay, so uh, that is how the URLs look. These are both URLs. These both just tell a browser where to look. Um, but uh, they just, you know, they're just different forms of the same thing. And in fact, you could specify an I a port for Wikipedia, but they wouldn't appreciate it. Their servers would say no. <laughs> yeah, it'd redirect you to the 443 port. <laughs> um, uh, yes. Uh, in uh, just to be correct, a URL is a subset of a URI. A URI is a uniform resource identifier rather than a locator. Um, and URIs are used for tons of stuff. Like when you um, open an app on your computer, it's probably using a URI. You know, if you have like a desktop, it's definitely on phones. If you have like an icon on your phone, when you tap that, it's opening a URI, which is just specifying what app to open. You can specify tons of stuff with URIs. Um, okay, that's all of my content. So are we gonna do a little switch? Uh, are we meet, uh, yeah, Joe, just mute us so we can. Okay, so you should be able to hear me fine. Uh, looks like I'm coming through. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm not usually a presenter for technical labs. That's kind of Alfie's job. But um, as we both know, I'm just so much better at programming than him. So uh, I'll be running this bit. Um, okay, so, uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I'm just kidding. He definitely knows more than me about all of this. Um, okay, so we don't really have, as Alfie said, we don't really have time to properly cover, you know, like, all of HTML or all of CSS or all of JavaScript. It's just each of those is just such a massive field and it's going to take you, it just takes so long to learn all of that. What we are going to try and do is we're going to use a framework called node.js to create a web server that's going to serve up some simple HTML. So we're going to kind of use a little bit from each of the kind of disciplines, I guess, uh, and hopefully that'll kind of get, get you to a point where you can go away and build on the code that we do here. Uh, so the code that I'm making will be available. Uh, we'll post the link at the end uh, to the GitHub. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, so we'll, we'll build that and then hopefully you can build on that project over the next 18 to 24 hours. I'm not entirely sure when the hackathon ends. But yeah, okay, so um, there's a few like things you really need uh, initially like to have installed. So firstly, node.js. Uh, so node.js is a JavaScript runtime environment. It allows you to basically write JavaScript code that doesn't run in a web browser. It actually runs on the server as a web server. Uh, so we'll be using it as the server for our web app. Um, in the notes, there is a link to download the installer uh, for Windows and Mac. If you're on Linux, good luck. Um, I think it is actually quite easy, but it requires some command line playing around. But then, obviously, if you're on Linux, there's kind of an assumption there that you do know more about this stuff. Uh, so yeah, so uh, so just follow the install installer instructions, and you should be good to check it's installed. There's a command which is uh, node dash v. Could you? Oh, no, that's fine. I got it. <laughs> um, so if you see here, I do this uh, node space dash V, which tells you the version number of the node if it's installed and it's replied with 12.13.0. So we have got node running. Um, 
NPM it stands for Node Package Manager. It basically allows you to install extra libraries for Node, um, and it's just this nice little program that runs and like pulls in all the dependencies you need for any project you make. Uh, it's the package manager for JavaScript. Package manager for JavaScript. We did a whole technical lab on package managers. We've done two technical labs on command line. We've done a technical lab on uh, like code editors. Um, so, but we're kind of just burning through that right now. Um, package managers are useful. They're very good. Um, when you install Node.js, npm will be installed automatically. Uh, to double check that, you can go npm space dash v, and that will show you it's installed and it tells you its version number. Um, finally, a good code ed editor is incredibly important and helps you massively in the long run once you're like familiar with one. Having said that, we don't have time to actually discuss um, code editors at all. Um, there are probably three main ones, Visual Studio Code, uh, JetBrains WebStorm, which is very expensive, but then you can get it for free as a student, um, or Atom. They're all very good choices for web dev. Um, I would say both Atom and WebStorm take a while to learn, but they have a lot more features. But for a hackathon, if you're just diving in, I'd say VS Code is the easiest option. So we'll be using VS Code. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so once we've got that stuff installed, uh, there's, so there's links in the, in the notes to all of these places where you can just download them pretty easily. Um, and this is not reinventing the wheel, right? Like a lot of people have come before you in terms of web dev and stuff. So most issues you hit regarding installing this stuff, a simple Google search should get you there because so many people use these tools. That's part, partly why we've picked these tools because they're some of the most used in web. Um, okay, so in this project, uh, Node.js will run on a server computer, which is my laptop, and we'll host a web server. Um, and we'll also be running the client on my laptop through the browser. Uh, anybody that goes to the correct web address, which in this case will be localhost 3000, just my dogs, um, will be, so anyone, I say anybody that goes to the correct web address because we haven't done port forwarding or we haven't got a domain name, hmm? firewall. firewall, so many different security things. The only person that will be able to access it is me on my computer um, or potentially anyone else in within our house. Uh, but yeah, so anybody that goes to the correct web address, assuming you've set it all up so anybody can access across the world, will be accessing the web server and interacting with whatever we write. So let's start by making an app.js file. Um, so basically, I've just I made a new folder. I've made a JavaScript file in it called app.js. You can call it whatever you want, really. Um, and I've written some code. Here's some I've done earlier. Um, so it's, it's pretty simple. This is pretty much the most bare bones node.js server that you can write. Uh, we're using a library called Express, which will do the kind of routing through the systems. Like if somebody goes to slash dogs, it runs a specific bit of code. If somebody goes to slash cats, it runs a different piece of code as you set it up in the server. Um, so we're using this library called Express. So at the top, we define Express as a, va a variable, a constant. And so const Express equals require Express, that tells node to pull in that library. Uh, we create a new instance of node. Uh, we set a port and we tell it to listen. Uh, console.log is just like a simple JavaScript command. That basically, it just prints something out to the command line when it will start up saying like, we're listening. So it's just kind of some visual proof that the server's running. Um, if I try and run this, so basically I'm, uh, I'm just gonna go into the folder you can see here there's app.js, uh, ignore anything else, they don't exist, I swear. Um, if we try to run it, it will error. Um, that's because we haven't installed the express library yet. That's pretty easy with npm, which is the package manager I, I potentially mentioned earlier. Uh, and basically there's just a command npm install express. And that will just pretty quickly install it. Uh, and then there we are, it's installed. So now to run, our node server, we do the command node app.js. And we can see that it printed out that text that it said it would print out here, which means the server's running. Um, now, if I go to, uh, so, so we're running a server on localhost, colon 3000. So if I go to that site, uh, let's just do that. 
uh, we see an error message, cannot get slash. That's fine, because we're not actually providing any content yet, right? This is just showing that the server is functioning. If I were to turn the server off and do this again, you can see the page doesn't exist at all. There is nothing there to even listen to that request. So I'm running the server, and we can see it's running. We're getting a response, even though the response is, there's nothing here. Um, yeah, OK. Uh, so there's let, let's, let's provide some content to display. So we're going to write a get endpoint for slash. So basically, slash is just your root directory, um, which is just so just like wikipedia.org is the root page, like the main page you go to it at the beginning. So we're going to write some code that puts some text on that page when we go to localhost. So we will define a get uh, Sorry, my uh, talking and coding is not my strong suit. Uh, but basically, we're saying uh, whenever somebody goes to the root directory, uh, like the, the main page, run this code inside of this bracket. And the code we want to run is we want to send a response, and the response will just be, hello world. Pretty standard computer science project. Um, so now, if I... If I were to go to the page now, nothing will happen. And that's because nothing has changed. And that's because we haven't restarted the server. There are tools out there. There's one called Nodemon, which is really, really useful. And uh, basically, it means whenever you modify a file in your project, it automatically updates the server. So then you never have to faff around with this. But it takes a while to set up and explain. Um, so we're not going to. Um, so yeah, so if I just restart the server here, when I then go to the main page, we can see instead of saying cannot get, it's printing hello world. Um, pretty simple, really. We're just returning some, whenever somebody goes to this page, we are returning some text. Okay. Um, all that's being sent by the server is the plain text. So there's this application called Postman. It's just free online. You can download it. It's very useful. And it essentially lets you inspect the requests being made by the server. So the server isn't building a whole web page here. It's just if I try to get that same endpoint that the web page is getting, all, you can see all that's being returned is text, right? Whereas normally, if I were to, uh, if this didn't exist, so this is a JavaScript comment. Uh, so when, when we're back to having the cannot get page, uh, if I get this, you can see it's actually returning the cannot get slash, and it's returned a little really, really simple HTML page. That's basically, um, Node itself doing that. We don't have any code that's doing that, but Node has gone, oh, there's nothing here. I'll just create a little web page that is explaining what's happening to the user. Um, so yeah. So Postman is really useful just for like inspecting what's actually happening because web browsers tend to hide things and interpret the code that's being sent to it and that kind of thing. Whereas Postman just shows you exactly what you're sending and receiving. Um, OK, uh, let's start serving an actual HTML page. Um, in, the, in the notes, there is a simple HTML page. It's pretty much exactly the one that Alfie actually went through earlier. Um, and I've just got it here called test.html. Um, I've made a folder here called public. Um, and in the public folder is the test.html file. Uh, that's just kind of a, you don't have to have a public folder. That's just the way I've chosen to do it to kind of separate all my code out into different folders. Um, so yeah, cool. So we've, I've also defined a, the main.css and main.js files that Alfie covered earlier. They're basically just this really simple JavaScript and CSS code um, that will just make the page look relatively pretty and will have some dynamic functionality. Um, ooh, I've done something. Uh, okay, so yeah, so our file structure all looks something like this. We've got a, a public folder, and then inside of that, we've got a CSS folder and a JavaScript folder with the respective files in there. Um, so now we've created some content to serve. Uh, let's serve it. So we're going to use uh, something called uh, the path library. It's built into Node, so you don't need to run npm install path. Uh, we just need to import it at the top of the file. So, yeah, at the top of app.js. Um, okay, here we go. So 
let's say test.html. So when somebody goes to localhost colon 3000 slash test, we want to show them the test page that we just created. Um, <laughs> to do this, we need to create a new endpoint like we did before with the slash. But instead of serving just some text, we're going to serve the file itself. So if I create a new, if I just copy this, in fact, uh, a new one, instead of slash, we're going to go slash test. So then basically that'll, that'll point anybody going to the slash test. It will serve them the correct information. Instead of uh, dot send, which is just going to send some text that we give it, we're going to, we're going to write dot send file. Uh, Alfie. You, sorry, just a second. The iPad just cut out on me. Um, thanks. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, so whenever somebody goes to the test endpoint, we're going to send a file. Uh, and the file we're going to send is just like uh, sl slash public slash test.html. Oh, I spelled that incorrectly. Um, so basically that'll look into the public folder and then find that file and it will get that file, uh, get the information in that file and then send it to the server. Um, it, it's a relative file path. I don't, um, again, I think there's basically a technical lab. Yeah, there's a technical lab regarding like relative, like file paths and command line stuff. Um, but basically just trust me when I say we need to include the directory that we're in in the file path. Uh, so basically this will, this will say, so the file path for where this file is, isn't actually public slash test.html. It's, God, it, you know, uh, users slash Joseph slash desktop slash technical labs. You know, it, it's a very long path and just that underscore underscore DIR name. Okay, okay, untitled folder slash technical labs, sure. But yeah, so basically that underscore dir name is pulling in that like whole file path beforehand before where the node server is actually being run. So that code that, if I just restart the server, uh, should just so this this is still doing the same thing on the root directory. No, sorry, the root uh, URL. And if I go to slash test, which we've just created, and press enter, it is showing us our page, right? It's not showing us a nice page, but it is showing us this. Uh, it is showing us test.html, right? We've got we've got some text, some smaller text, and then a button where it says count zero. Um, okay, so it's the button's not doing anything, and it's and the page isn't styled, right? Um, here uh, on the side here, I've got uh, Chrome Developer Tools open. You can right click and click Inspect, or you can press F12 uh, or Function F12 on a Mac. Um, and you, there's a console tab at the top. So here you can see there's a lot of red. Red is bad. Um, you don't want red. Red means you've made a mistake. Um, so what, you, what we're seeing here is basically uh, failed to load resource. The server responded with a status of 404, which is like file not found. So basically, the client doesn't have access to the main.css and main.js files that we're attempting, that the HTML is attempting to pull in. That's fine. Um, what we're going to do, that, that's basically node protecting all those files because you don't want anybody to be able to access every single file on your, on your server computer. Um, that's fine. So what we'll do is we will define up here uh, app.use uh, express.static the public fol folder. So basically this is saying, ooh, this is basically saying we want to be, able, we want to show the entire public folder. Um, yeah, we want to be able to show the entire public folder um, and so anybody connecting to the web server is going to be able to access all of the files within that public folder. So now I've done that, uh, if I go to the page, and you can see I'm just restarting the, I'm just restarting the server every time just because we haven't, haven't got Node1 installed, so that's just something you'll need to remember to do. Uh, if I reload, we can see the CSS and JavaScript is now in and there's no errors in the console. Uh, Pretty simple. It's basically if we actually go to a localhost colon three thousand slash uh, CSS slash ma slash main dot CSS, we can see that is this is that file that is in the public folder, but it's just being displayed 
like it's basically given us the file itself. Same with main.js. It's there, right? But then slash test is pulling those files in from the HTML and using them to make it look good. And now we have our dynamic functionality of every time you press the button, the number goes up by one. Wow. Um, <laughs> programming. Yeah, yeah, programming. Um, so the system we've created so far is just a really, really simple counter. Um, whenever we click on the button on the web page, the number increases by one. Uh, however, this is entirely implemented within the client side JavaScript, right? So if I go to the main.js, this is basically, there's a count value, which is set to zero. And whenever somebody clicks button one, count plus plus. So count equals count plus one. Basically count plus plus is just a shortcut for increasing the value of count by one. Uh, and then what we're doing is we're setting the, like the HTML content of the button to be some text, which is count and then the value of the count. So basically, it's updating this text every time we click on the button based on what the variable is. Ba yeah, based on the value of the variable. Yeah, um, Yeah. so this is entirely client side, right? This, this isn't interacting with the server at all regarding like this count value. So if I were to refresh the page like this, the count number's gone back to zero because the count value is lost and then recreated on reload of the page. As Alfie had said before, there's no real way to store data in the client side. There's cookies and hacky ways and but that's not really helpful to us because if we wanted to say uh yeah update our password on wikipedia.org uh then updating it just on the client side is not going to do anything because then next time you try to log in the server won't know that your password's changed but yeah it's it's like you need to be able to communicate to the server this information um yeah so let's let's go through how to actually communicate between the client and the server. So we're going to create a few new API endpoints in app.js. Uh, firstly, we're going to, yeah, okay. So the data that's being sent back and forth between the client and server can be in lots of different formats, right? Like right now here, we're sending a file. So essentially we're sending, it's loading in the file and sending it in as text. Here, we're literally just sending a string, so just some text. Um, what is often sent nowadays in like a modern web stack is uh, JSON. So J S O N. Uh, oh, that is a bad pen. Have we got a good one? Thanks. Uh, so J S O N, which is JavaScript object notation. Basically, it's just a funky way of uh, storing data and sending data, right? Um, so yeah, JSON, JSON's really good. There's also XML and a few other standards that are kind of older and less used now, or should be less used now. <laughs> um, but so we're gonna be sending really, really simple JSON objects back and forth between the client and the server, uh, which will contain some information. So initially we need to run app.use express.json. Uh, so basically we're just gonna tell the node server that we're going to be uh, interpreting JSON, and so it's going to pull in the correct libraries for that. So it's going to just be able to read the JSON for us. Uh, we're also going to, on the server, create a counter value and set it to zero at the start of the server. So this, uh, yeah, so we've pulled in the express JSON functions, which will allow us to like read and understand the JSON objects being sent back and forth. And we've set a new variable called counter. We'll now make a, another endpoint. Uh, we'll call it uh, slash API slash get val. So we're gonna get the value of that counter. We're gonna, when the web page requests the value of the counter, it's gonna return that uh, counter, whatever this value currently is. Um, yeah, okay, so first we will make a response JSON object. Um, again, this is stuff that like we really, in an ideal world, we would explain in some detail, but basically we're going to we, we, it's like a key, a key value pair, which is not really helpful information. Uh, we are we are defining a field called count, and we are putting in the value of the this counter variable, right? Uh, so this this little object is going to be sent to the client side, and then the client will know the value of that int. Uh, we're then just going to send this object, but we're going to use a command called json.stringify, which will basically just turn this JSON object into some text. And then on the other end, the text will be turned into a JSON object. Uh, 
right? So then basically we're just sending some, some text, same as what we were doing here, but the text is in a specific format that the client's going to easily be able to read. Um, so now if I reset the server, if I go to localhost slash API slash get val, it will return count zero, right? Um, because right now this count, we're not doing anything with this counter value, so it will always be zero. Okay, that's fine. Um, it's giving us basically a little JSON object, which will yeah, define all that stuff and give us that information in a nice format. Um, let's now create another endpoint, which instead of a get, which is what you do when you're requesting data from the server, uh, we'll do a, a posts basically update. Uh, well, yeah, they, they set information on the server, essentially. Uh, so we'll, we'll make an increment endpoint, which will increment, which will increase the value of counter by one every time we call it. Uh, uh, bah, 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 bah. Uh, okay, so just, we've just covered like a whole field of computer science in one line. Uh, let me write it and then I'll explain. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically what's happening here is there's all in all of these things that we have a rec and a res, right? So rec is basically the request. So the thing, the client, the data that the client is sending along with the request is in the rec value, and res is the response value. So we're always doing res dot send because response has res has like a whole load of functions within it that allow us to send data back to the client. Um, so up until now, we've only been sending data. We haven't been looking at the data that the, the client sent to us. But here, we are looking at the body of the request. So we're looking at the information in the request, and we're looking for the count value. So we're going to have the client sending a count value, and then we're going to incre increment the counter value. I named everything too similarly, didn't I? Uh, we're going to increment the counter value by the amount of the count value. Um, <laughs> yeah, so basically this is turning this string, this text, into a number, so then we can add it to counter. And then we're going to send back the same JSON object that we were sending for get. So basically we're going to, what's going to happen is the client is going to request, request that this number gets increased. The server is then going to increase the number and send back the new number. Um, so yeah, so we're going to simulate this request in Postman. Uh, right, so right now if I go, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so localhost colon 3000 slash API slash increment is our new post endpoint and set it to post, not get. As, as you can see here, there's a, lot of end, there's a lot of different HTTP request types. We're only focusing in on get and post. I'm going to send this information. So I would like to increase the count by one. When I send this, the server replies with, okay, the count is now one. If I run, uh, is this visible actually? Yeah. Okay. Um, if I run it again, what we'd expect is the count value returned by the server to now be two. So if I run it again, we're going incre to increase the count value by one again. And now the count value is two. So if I, this time I actually want to increase it by five. If I run it again, the count value is now seven. So we can see that the server is storing data, and every time we run this post endpoint, it's updating the value, and then it's returning the new value. Um, if I run my little... Uh, get thing, so localhost slash API slash get val, which is a get request, it should return count is seven. So we're not sending in any data, we're not telling it to update that value, we're just asking for the value with a get request. Um, yeah, uh, so with those two calls, we can now implement some sort of server-side state uh, for this variable that will survive the refresh of a web page. Uh, so let's modify our JavaScript code in main.js. Uh, so the main.js is the JavaScript that's running on the client side, whereas app.js is the node server running on the server side. Um, got so much overloading of words. Um, yeah, okay, so we'll add some really, really simple code. So jQuery, which is a JavaScript library we're using on the client side, uh, has some really nice, pretty simple uh, ways of calling get and post requests. So if we, when the page is ready, we don't want to set the count value to zero. We want to set the count value to whatever it is currently on the server. So we will do a dot, uh, we'll 
create a get, oh, we will run the get function and we will get information from API slash uh, get val. Uh, oh, that is wrong in the notes. Oh well. Um, so I've, I've used a slightly different naming scheme in the notes, but that should be fine. Um, so you should kind of recognize this syntax of like, we're doing a thing and then run this function afterwards with, with the returned data. Uh, so if I now create a, right, uh, let's pass the string, the, the text that's being sent to us. We know the text has been sent in a JSON format, which will be like, oh, where's the pen? There it is. Uh, Right, so we know it's this format. So we're going to run json.pass on data. And then we know if we do dot count, we will, if we request the, val the value of count, so if I write dot count, this, this count value, okay, no, yeah, sure. This count value will be set to seven, okay, because we've read in the data. Um, we will then use this variable uh, and update the text in the button like we did down here. Uh, so, yeah, that should be fine. Uh, so now it's going to, when at the beginning of the app, it's going to request the, yeah, at the, at the start of the, when we first load up the web page, it's going to uh, request the value of uh, count from the server, and then it's going to display it. So when we first go onto the page, it will have retained that information. We want one more, which is whenever we click the button, we want to, up, we want to post and update the value on the server by one. Uh, we can get rid of this now because we're not going to increase the value of count on the client side. We're going to increase it on the server side. So we're going to run a post command on API slash increment. Uh, okay, and we are going to send the data count to one. So this is just like what we were doing in Postman where I was sending this data. So I want to increase the number by five. And then the server was replying with, okay, this is the new number. So we are running, I want to increase the number by one, and then it will reply with, uh, data. It's just like with the get. So then again, we will pass that, pass that JSON object to get the count value, and we will update the button text to include it. Um, so now if I restart the server, Uh, when I go to slash test, we have a button. And when I click on the button, oh, <laughs> I've done something wrong. Um, that's always good. What have I done, Alfie? Did I, it is get val, yeah. <laughs> whoops, whoops. Uh, local. Um, okay, sorry. Give me a second. If I that is not returning the right value, and that is also not returning the right value. So basically, this count is counter. Am I being really dumb? Probably. Uh, It was both of them. They're both counter is set to null. Um, you got the code open yeah. for. I did restart the server, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, you, you don't, you're not seeing any of this. So this is something you should expect, um, failure. It's, it's something I'm very used to, I know, um, as a programmer. Um, so this is code that is definitely happy, and I'm going to wonder what I did wrong. Oh! No? Okay. <laughs> sure. So this is code that's, I, I mean, it looks identical. Have I, have I just messed this up instead? Uh. Um, don't put the quote marks around count in the code. I don't know if that's a problem. 
Yeah, potentially. Ba, 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 ba. Uh, trim the surface. Yeah. Let me just. Sorry about this. Um, changed. Nothing. Okay. Well. <laughs> yeah. So I probably just mistyped something uh, in my rush. Uh, okay. And now it's working. Um, so that's, it is the same code. I've just obviously made some very dumb mistake somewhere. I'm going to have a look back later and figure out where that was, but that's fine. Um, well, that was quite impressive. Um, so yeah, so we're increasing this value by one and it's increasing it on the server. If I refresh the page, it is loading in that value and the value is staying solid. It, that's fine. If we were to, instead of sending count one to the server, we'd send count two. That means that every time I click the button, it goes up by two, not one. Uh, so we're sending different data and it's giving it's doing different things. Um, yeah, so whenever the page loads, the code now makes a GET request to the API to get the count value from the server. When it gets this, it's updating the HTML in the button to display the value. And whenever the button is clicked, a POST request is made to the API, passing in the count value of one or two or seven or whatever we want. Um, and, and then the value on the server is incremented by that amount. The server returns the new, the new total to the client and the client updates the HTML to display the value. So um, that's pretty much as far as we're planning to go in terms of this example, right? Uh, in terms of state. Uh, there is a lot more you can do and we're actually going to link to a repository on GitHub that has a few more examples of things you can do with like uh, forms which let you put text in and that kind of thing. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just, it's nice stuff. Um, but there's a whole load of uh, frameworks and libraries that are really good and are used in industry massively. So you've got libraries like Bootstrap and FontAwesome. Bootstrap is essentially a way of making your HTML actually have good layout without you having to mess around with CSS loads. So then it gives you like the ability to just separate the page into different sections and you can put different code in different sections. Uh, but Bootstrap will probably take a couple of hours to understand properly. Um, so it's like, it's a nice tool, but it's not anything we're going to teach. Um, there's Font Awesome, which is essentially a really nice little uh, library, HTML, CSS, JavaScript library for the client side that essentially implements another, it, like you're just loading in a font, but the font is not actually letters. It's a ridiculously large set of uh, icons. Uh, so like if I go to Font Awesome, you can see there's all manner of oh, all manner of icons and it's like it, it's just a way of making your site look really nice really easily a uh, font awesome i would recommend for any project like this uh, just because it really is quite easy to set up and get started with and there's lots of stuff online regarding that there's also uh frameworks uh so like you've got react you might have heard of and angular these are incredible incredible tools and nowadays not that many people build sites in just plain html css javascript which is what we did today however react and angular take weeks or months to actually learn to any sort of competent level so uh it's just it's not worth it it's not worth the pain um unless you have a time machine um so so yeah i mean what TypeScript, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, so that's, I think that's pretty much everything we were planning to cover. Um, so Alfie went through a lot of theory uh, and then I kind of hopefully gave you a decent uh, getting started guide, I guess. Have we sent the link to the repository? Okay, good. So the code is all there. It, it is functional code um, because I just copied it off of there to, to fix my code. Um, oh, it's going to bug me. Uh, Okay, anyway, um, yeah, so I think that's everything. Any last words? Any questions?
And any questions? Yeah, just uh, post in the chat as as needed. You wanna? Q and a. What are we saying? Uh, yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, we're not quite set up for uh, uh, conversation, but uh, yeah, it's. Um, we hope you guys found it useful. And uh, if you want more of this, we did a whole. We did like nine sessions like this last semester. Yes, the technical lab to... site has all of this stuff. It's a lot of like useful frameworks and tools around programming mm -hmm. rather than programming itself. I highly um, recommend Git for hackathons. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll check for any questions. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Hopefully, it's helpful. Um, yeah, and looking forward to seeing all the stuff that gets created out of this. In a normal technical lab, we'd have a slow fade to black, and then some jazz music would come on. It would be very professional. Um, but yeah, okay. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, we are going to be on the platform for the next half hour, at least. Uh, drop us a message if you want. Any computer scientists in the Discord can also just message us directly as as needed. Uh, we're ha more than happy to help answer any questions. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks.